Hi, I'm Robin Steinberg. Welcome to the National Quiz Choice Online News. Say it at heart. And I have today uh, Mr. Jacques uh, Moulier, who's uh, actually one of the pioneers, uh, the founding pioneers in animation. And he has done great work alongside with, uh, for Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And also he has worked alongside with uh, George Lucas as well for some of the Star Wars projects. And today we're going to find out more about uh, Mr. Uh, Jacques Moulier uh, of his life and and his future uh, for Southeast Asia, um, especially animation. Um, Mr. Jake uh, Mouliet, welcome to the National Grid's Choice. Thank you. And uh, I know that you're, you're one of the the best, perhaps, no, uh, animators in the world. There's quite a bunch of excellent animators in the world. Uh, I'm talking not only 3D animation, but also on traditional 2D animation. There are quite a few very good ones. Unfortunately, there are less and less 2D features. Uh, it's mostly 3D today. So some of them were able to ramp up to 3D. Others didn't. So that's something people don't know usually. People are very interested, and especially my readers, are trying to find out though, what made you start uh, your career in animation. I mean, what, what is your passion? Um, it started from childhood. I was totally amazed, I was totally baffled by seeing uh, drawings coming to life. Um, so, like most uh, children, uh, kids, I love drawing, of course. I mean, it's uh, natural for kids to draw. And uh, I tried to copy the, the characters I would see in the Disney films from an early age onwards. And then I started uh, afterwards, we're around 12 years old, to draw comics. Oh, wow. And so I tried to develop that on the side, but uh, eventually, after being published when I was 17 in a, a newspaper on a daily basis, uh, after that first experiment, I went back to animation, which I absolutely love. So this is it. Oh, but what's your love of, of comics and animation like you know, in those days? Because I know that they don't have those kind of effects that we have today. Correct. You know? Well, to me, animation in its purest form was already uh, an effect. You see, it was special effects because it's uh, called by uh, some uh, very famous animators from Disney who did this splendid book called The Illusion of Life, which is the Bible for all serious animators, Frank oh. Thomas and Ollie Johnson, who I had the uh, pleasure to meet. Uh, it's called The Illusion of Life, literally. So not only solid drawings come to life, but they give you the illusion of life. That's the idea. Wow. Now, uh, and what is the definition of the illusion of life? Well, you know, uh, it has all to do with a discovery that was made uh, in the 19th century uh, about the persistence of vision. So the uh, human eye, uh, human eye uh, is fooled in a way, our brain is fooled uh, when uh, there's sufficient uh, numbers of drawings that you flip successively in a very uh, rapid motion the brain uh, registers it as if it was a fluid movement where in fact it's only a trick this is why in germany uh, animation is called trick film because you trick the eyes and you, you actually the brain does the mm -hmm. makes the link between the the images ah. so it's persistence of vision basically now speaking about persistence you have been very persistent in your career <laughs> uh, and you know it's it's amazing how you, know, you are able to find your way in, in probably luck, they call, you know, to land yourself in a project uh, like Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Mm -hmm. um, now, before your, your term uh, in that project, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you know, uh, what were the other emanations that you have experimented? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I started my first attempts at home uh, with the 8mm uh, uh, home movie camera when I was around 14, 15 years old. And uh, because I didn't have anybody to teach me, uh, it was a little difficult because uh, if you have no prior knowledge of animation, you are automatically going to run into errors, big errors. Um, and uh, it's only with the advent of uh, video recorders, which uh, were available to the public around 1981, when I got my first uh, video recorder, I was able to not only uh, record animation from television, but also I was able to play it frame by frame. So that's where everything clicked. 
there was something else called a little uh, Super 8 movie, uh, a little machine that you could play little films, but it was very limited. Even though you could play it back and forth, but I thought the video recorder was a hundred times better, because then you could really play very beautiful animation frame by frame. And then I started to understand what meant motion analysis. Because it's not just, uh, you don't just have different drawings and you try to link the gaps with what we call in-betweens. That's not going to give you a good animation. It may give you something fluid, but totally unrealistic. What you have is to do it the Disney way, which is to have to understand the anatomy of your character. Mm -hmm. And so you have to animate all that structure which is under the skin of your character. You have to know where the pelvis is, where the spine is, where the shoulder blades are. Okay, for a cartoon character it might be a little bit simpler than that, but the principle remains the same. So it's only when you have motion analysis capability that you understand how a tiger jumps and uh, uh, runs, or a cat, or a dog, or a horse. You have to know these things. And I, I could only discover it as uh, I went along. It did not happen overnight. Hmm. Now, did your family uh, discover that, that you had a, uh, a talent for for animation, you know, did they, did they, did they uh, well, felt I, supportive? Well, I, I, I don't want to be offensive, uh, ne neither to my family or any per person uh, uh, at large. But uh, most people I, I, I am acquainted with, uh, first of all, my family, of course, they don't really go into depth with this thing. They look at the stuff, they say, oh, it looks nice. But they don't have a really a critical eye, like professionals do, you know what I mean? So as long as they saw that I was pursuing my career, I went from comics into animation, from uh, little uh, things like French TV animation up to bigger things like international feature film for the American market and the world, then they, they saw everything was fine, <laughs> excellent for me. So that they were happy as far as that is concerned. They didn't have to know all the intricacies of, of my work, if you, uh, so to speak. Oh. Now, just to move forward right now, and the time that you got the, the project, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you know, were there any challenges beforehand? You know, did you did you have an agent or a manager to Actually, I didn't it? have any agent. Uh, actually, by the way, Roger Rabbit is not my project. I mean, it's, uh, as you know, Disney, Spielberg, mm -hmm. Richard Williams, Bob Zemeckis project. But, uh, yes, uh, you know, you, it's not a smooth ride, definitely not. First of all, you are struggling because you are still learning the craft as you go. And uh, uh, I also got involved uh, by the wrong end, which was the TV animation. Not to say that uh, TV animation is bad, but just to say that in those days, in the late 70s, uh, 80s and 90s, actually 80s, uh, I was involved with TV animation, which uh, takes all the shortcuts possible. So TV animation in those days looked entirely different from feature animation, which is the high end of, uh, of animation. So I had pretty much to unlearn all the things I had learned during my TV animation period, which was about 10 years. And then it's only when I got to move on to small serious projects like Roger Rabbit and, and Rescues Down Under that uh, I could really do a fully fledged piece of animation, much more elaborate, much more sophisticated. Now, everybody wants to know, how do you get, got yourself involved with the project uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Though? Was it the, by uh, accident? Uh, actually, you know, uh, you run into people as you go along with your career, and uh, <clears throat> there was one person that was really key uh, for my uh, various moves, and it's a good friend of mine whose name is uh, Alain Costa. Uh, he worked for uh, the French Walt Disney, even though nobody uh, called him that way, and probably he would not have liked it himself. He's passed away now. His name was Paul Grimaud, and he was uh, really, uh, uh, he's a big name in French animation history. He did uh, uh, The King and Mr. Bird, uh, which is a very famous fr uh, French film. It took like 30 years to complete it. And uh, Walt Disney met with him and offered him, it's the only time I heard such a story, he offered him actually to lead a Disney studio in Europe in the 50s, but he turned it down. So Alain Costa worked for this uh, man, uh, Paul Grimaud, and uh, he was on loan from a small uh, co a commercial studio who I happened to work for. So when I got to meet Alain Costa, 
we actually uh, connected uh, in Australia at the same time. We started for animation studio in Australia. I stayed on for six years. He left back uh, to go back to Paris for t uh, two, after two years. And uh, we kept uh, um, corresponding. And uh, he told me, yeah. he, he told me, pardon? And there were no emails at that time. There was no, just it was just letters, letters right? Wow. Correct, correct. Challenging. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, at some point he said, oh, I'm in London now and I'm working on this fantastic film. You should really come over, uh, drop at, uh, any minute all what you're doing because this is such a great project. It's headed by Richard Williams and it's called Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And uh, at the time with my two friends, Brenda and Warren from uh, Australia, we had a small company and we were trying to raise funds to do a feature film of our own. So at that point, uh, what happened is that uh, uh, I was still trying to raise the funds. I really wanted to do that project. But eventually, uh, after several producers approached us, and there was a crisis in Australia, economic crisis, and the animation industry collapsed at some point, definitely uh, I wrote back to Alain and said, OK, we've got to give it a try. And so we sent a pilot of a, one of a project, a feature film project. And Don Hahn, the producer of Roger Rabbit, uh, responded and said, okay, you can come over. At the time, I had been an animation director for an uh, Australian studio, and he said, well, I'm sorry, I can't hire you as an animation director, you know. And uh, I was cool with that, I totally understood, so I said, I don't mind if I have to enter through the back door, as long as I can come out from the front door. So that's pretty much what happened. So your experience with Roger Rabbit, what was it like? I mean, it was the, the defining moment for animation. Uh, for me, it was a pivotal point in my career, most definitely. There was like a few stepping stone, and Roger Rabbit is definitely the major stepping stone in my career because after having uh, passed through uh, 10 years of TV animation, Roger Rabbit suddenly opened all the doors for me. So basically, because of the cost of uh, producing animation film of, of such uh, scale in uh, England, the parity uh, pound versus US dollar was not in favor of keeping that studio in London. That's why they pulled back the operation uh, in Burbank, California, to do the f following uh, movies like Rescue Down Under. And they handpicked a few people from the crew, and I was one of those. We were like four or five that were offered to sign up for Walt Disney uh, California, Walt Disney Burbank. And so in January 89, I was flown over to Burbank. And the irony is, at the time when I just landed, another division of Disney, uh, television, network television, uh, Guy Chrysler offered me to drop everything to open a studio in Paris. And uh, I recommended that he should contact the Britzy brothers, who did uh, one segment of Fantasia 2000, the Firebird, the beautiful stuff. I said, you should talk to them. And six months later, I go to the NEC Film Festival and I bump into the Britzy brothers and say, Hey, Jack, do you know Walt Disney acquired us? We are now Walt Disney friends. And I thought, wow, that's nice. And then eventually I bumped again into Guy Chrysler at uh, NEC. And he said, Jack, really, you know, my offer still stands. If you want to be directing, the, leading the studio in Paris with uh, the Britzy brothers, please come on board. But I, my dream came true only when I joined Disney Burbank. This is what I wanted as a child, to work for Disney in California. And so my dream was coming true. So I thought, I don't want to be going back to France. I'm happy here. That's what I want to do, you know. And that's what happened. Now, tell us about uh, innovation. What does innovation uh, mean to a animator like yourself? Because you have started the pioneering uh, series uh, from Roger Rabbit, because Roger, Roger Rabbit is the is the the uh, you know the pivotal well, point yes. uh, for animated, uh, animators in the world. Well, actually, uh, what happened is it pretty much uh, revived the genre. I mean, uh, animation has been pretty much uh, 2D animation, even classical feature, grand scale animation has been pretty much uh, in the doldrums for some time and then came along Roger Rabbit. So in what way was it different from what we saw before? I mean, not to forget that uh, combination character animation with live action had been done before, more or less successfully. There were early attempts as early as 1923 
with Walt Disney doing the Alice series, Alice in Cartoonland, and then later on um, other studios like the Fleischer Brothers toyed away with Betty Boop or with Coco the Clown, and eventually Disney came back to it with Song of the South and later on Mary Poppins. But uh, there was something that had not been achieved at that time, which was uh, to unlock the camera on the stage. Before, uh, before that, it was a no-no in the industry. You have to have a steel camera. The only thing you can do eventually is our uh, horizontal pans, but that's it. Otherwise, the camera is completely locked. And then when they did a test with Richard Williams, Robert Zemeckis and Spielberg asked uh, Richard Williams to make a test. And Richard Williams, grandmaster of animation, uh, world renowned, uh, excellent uh, director and everything, uh, just said, let's forget about uh, having a locked camera. Now we are going to let the director do his live action film, like he doesn't have to worry about animators, just do your film as you would uh, in a normal uh, live action film. And then we'll uh, figure out how to uh, include uh, the characters into your live action film. And that's what they did. So eventually we had to have every shot printed out in large format on photostats, black and white photostat, all registered with uh, those uh, registration holes that allow the, all the series of drawings to be totally locked in. And so animators were given stacks of photographs with those peg holes, and we were putting animation paper on, on the top of every photograph. Of course, you couldn't have too many because through the light box, you couldn't see uh, through if you didn't have more than three or four. But that was enough to flip our, our drawings and to be able to position the character. Because since the camera was constantly moving, you can play Roger Rabbit and you will see it's constantly moving. Uh, it's not still. So that's part of the illusion, that the character is following exactly and de delivering a performance at the same time. Of course, it's much harder to do, but it's just something you have to acquire. Today, today's uh, animation now is focusing towards, like you said, you know, moving towards 3D. Yeah. Um, and uh, are anima animators around the world, are they open to, to this change? Um, definitely. Uh, you know, it's a very big world. I don't have to tell you this. Not only is it big, but also uh, people have now so many mixed influence from all, all sides. It's really, I mean, very rich at this point in time. And uh, you would notice also that live action is also starting to merge with animation. Mm -hmm. So it's not just 2D animation merging with 3D, but it's also live action. So now everything is possible because technology allows fantastic things to be done. Um, now it's more a matter of uh, the skills talents, uh, the uh, creativity of the people, and how uh, skilled they are in using the new tools of today. But what's wonderful is you can now make films that look like hand-drawn, even though they're not entirely hand-drawn. There's a part of a digital technology that is involved as well. But that doesn't mean uh, that because we have such futuristic uh, tools to play with, uh, we don't. We have to do away with uh, traditional craftsmanship. On the contrary, I think we have to make put an accent on this uh, traditional skill and just mix everything together in a smart way to bring uh, images that have never been seen before. Huh. Do you have any lifetime quotes that you live by? Because you are a big fan of Walt Disney. Uh, well, actually, uh, along the years. Uh, I continue to learn more and more about Walt Disney, not only the man, but also the organization and everything. It's a big thing, it's huge. I mean, you have to consider that they've done, what, 37, 40 feature films, that each feature film, a classic uh, feature film, took about two million drawings to achieve. So that's a staggering amount of work and man hours and talents, and it's totally amazing. So, uh, yes, I have many, uh, uh, example that really inspired me, aside from Walt Disney the man, and that was uh, the main animators who worked for him, like uh, Fred Moore, Norm Ferguson, uh, Bill Teitler, the Nine Old Men, uh, Mill Cole, Frank Thomas, Ollie Johnson, Mark Davis, and many more. All these people were amazing people in their own right, and they've been a, a tremendous inspiration, such as uh, also Richard Williams has been a great, great inspiration. And at Warner Brothers, uh, someone like Chuck Jones, for instance, uh, one of the fathers of Bugs Bunny. And there was also Tex oh. Avery and Paul Grimaud, many, many. But do you have a quote that you live by? Like, uh, 
like a, a, a old saying, you know. Well, I, I don't know if I can come up with any old saying, but basically it's just trying to be totally true, authentic and honest toward uh, that art form that we call animation. Uh, I mean, there are people who master it many more, many in much better ways than I do. And uh, it's not a competition, you know, it's about the love of that art form. Uh, because uh, that art form encompass many other art forms. It's not just about drawing, it's not just about uh, color, painting, it's music, uh, drama, uh, comedy, theater, it's, it's cinematography. It's all in one. Mm. So it encompass many, many facets. Actually. Amazing. And uh, may I ask also, what is animation today? Because animation now, you have three, 2D, yeah. you have 3D, yeah. you even have IMAX. Yes. Uh, so is animation uh, seen as valuable as, as it was yesterday? You know, it's uh, it's just uh, spilling over into many other facets of life. It's not just limited to entertainment anymore. And I believe that as we go along in the coming years, we're going to see animation everywhere, maybe on the door handles, maybe uh, uh, when you open books, uh, everything will be moving, and they will have holograms, projections. And you will have animation uh, every corner. You go to the airport, you, you get your boarding pass, and you have a little animated uh, holographic character popping out. I'm sure this is in the making. Are you going to see uh, the emergence of more jobs will be created for animators here in Southeast Asia? I mean, now that you are here at the uh, Nanyang Polytechnic and, you know, and you're heading the department, and are you seeing a lot of potential uh, you know, talent here? Oh, uh, there are definitely talents in Singapore, absolutely. Um, there are a lot of uh, young students who are, have very promising skills. Uh, they need just to be guided. Uh, they have to be, because when you're young, uh, you're discovering all the things and there are so many different stimuli uh, coming at you from, uh, from the media and every, everything that it's almost diffi difficult to choose, you know. But I definitely believe that there are talents in Singapore that just need to be nurtured and encouraged and uh, they're learning fast also. How does one able to create the imagination in animation? You know, it's almost like an acquired thing. Uh, I'm sorry, a natural thing. You have people who are naturally uh, gifted with creativity and others are not, you know. I mean, I think it's a trait of character. So I would say you have to encourage the people toward a certain side of that, uh, of that uh, craftsmanship. Uh, and if it's traditional, of course, it's 2D, but it could be 3D. It could be also many other aspects of uh, animation, like uh, story, story writing is very important. We need story writer. We need uh, people who have a sense of uh, storytelling. It's very important because everything uh, originates from story. What advice would you give for future animators you know, to be uh, from your life experience? Uh, never to quit. Uh, you will uh, struggle possibly, but uh, you should never quit. You should always pursue your dreams. I mean, it sounds very corny. I know other people have said it before me, but it's definitely true. Pursue your dream, and fight for it, go for it, and never get discouraged. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Jacques Moulier. And mm -hmm. And thank you for joining us here at the National Quiz Choice uh, Say at Hyatt.